Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and I really hope you're enjoying Homecoming so far. I actually found myself listening to it while I was taking a bath a little while ago, so it relaxed me, and I hope it's relaxing to you and something you can enjoy even if you're not watching and just have it on in the background. But anyway, here we go. Chapter 2. Dicey awoke at the first light. A chilly dew beaded the windshield. James's body leaning against her side was the only warmth in the car. He still slept so she didn't move, even though her stiff muscles ached to be stretched. She watched the sun rise into a cold gray sky that turned warmer and brighter as the first peach-colored beams of light grew golden, then yellow, then white. Surrounded by sleepers, Dicey sat content. The car was a cave within which they were safe. It held them together, and it protected them from outside forces, the cold, the damp, people. At last, James stirred and his eyes opened. All four of them had the same hazel eyes, although Dicey and James had their father's dark hair, not the yellow hair their mother had passed on to Maybeth and Sammy. Excuse me. James's hazel eyes looked at Dicey for a minute before he spoke. It's still true. His voice was hollow and sad. Their mama was really gone. Dicey nodded. Sammy surged over from the back seat. I gotta go to the bathroom. Bad. Dicey turned her head and a muscle protested all the way down her back. Maybeth, you awake? Maybeth was awake. Okay, then, let's take our clothes, bags, and change, and the food bag, too, if you'd like to eat breakfast outside. Dicey took the map of Connecticut and jammed it into her clothes bag. It was Sunday, and nothing moved in the parking lot. The same few cars stood empty. The air was clear, clean, lucid, lying lightly upon the world that morning. The children scrambled out of the car, and Dicey led them across the highway to the woodsy patch where they had hidden the night before. Or, excuse me, where she had hidden the night before. She led them into the thickest clustering of trees, then they separated to go to the bathroom. They ate the last peanut butter sandwiches sitting on a low stone wall, listening to a few birds and watching the sunlight fall in bright moving patterns onto the leafy floor of the woods. The air grew warmer. Dicey finished her sandwich and crumpled the wax paper up. She tossed it into the food bag. Then she stripped down to her underpants and put on a pair of cut-off jeans and a t-shirt. She also put on a pair of socks. The others changed, too. Dicey insisted that they wear socks. Why? James asked. It's hotter with socks on. If we're going to walk, they'll keep us from getting blisters. Is that true? James demanded. I never had a blister. Of course it's true, Dicey answered. Now let me look at the map and think, all of you. The little ones explored the patch of woods while Dicey studied the map. Route 1 was the road they'd been driving on. They could follow it for a while, then they'd have to go on the turnpike to get over the Thames River to New London. After that, they'd have to switch to a road that followed the coastline because Route 1 turned into the turnpike for a long while. There was the Connecticut, then there was the Connecticut River to cross, then Route 1 again, or maybe they could take a coastal road to New Haven. After New Haven, the map showed a yellow patch connecting the cities all the way down to Bridgeport. That meant heavily populated areas, but Route 1 Route 1 ran the whole distance. Dicey looked at the map. Maybe two or three days, she judged. They had about seven dollars. They could spend about two dollars a day on food, half of what they'd spent on the meal yesterday. But that was okay, because you didn't starve in two or three days. You could get awfully hungry, but you wouldn't starve. James, she called. Maybath, Sammy, come here now. They ran up and sat in a circle around the map. Dicey showed them where Bridgeport was and about where they were. Then she made her announcement. We're going to walk down to Bridgeport. The idea was so factual in her mind that she was unprepared for questions. What about Mama? Sammy asked. I don't know where she's got to, Dicey said. We can wait for her here, Sammy said, his mouth puckered up. No, we can't, Dicey said, and she told them about the guard. Mama will know we went on to Aunt Scylla's, Dicey said. James Sammy's mouth set into a firm line. We can't go back, Dicey said and we've got to go somewhere. That's all right, James spoke, but why don't we take the bus? Because we don't have enough money. Each ticket is two forty-five. That makes $9.80 altogether, and we've only got $7. If we hadn't had supper last night, James said. Dicey had already been over that in her own mind, but we did, she cut him off, so it's no good thinking. If we didn't, we're going to have to walk. Maybeth? Maybeth looked up from a pile of stones she was making into a long circle around herself. That's fine, Dicey, she said. No questions, no worries in her round hazel eyes. Just, that's fine. 
Dicey felt like hugging her. How far is it? James asked. I don't know for sure, Dicey said. How far can we walk in a day? James asked. There's only one way to find out, isn't there? Dicey asked. Only Sammy didn't smile in return. It'll be hard, she added. We have to carry as little as possible, just one bag for all of us. They sorted through their bags. Sammy refused to speak or help, just sat cross-legged with his jaw set, picking at the dirt with his finger. Dicey took out two changes of underwear and two clean shirts for each. Then she added a pair of extra socks and one comb. Toothbrushes they could get at Aunt Scylla's. There was about a half bag full when she was through. It felt light enough in the cool morning, but she knew that it would get heavier as the day went on. She inhaled the sun-sweetened air and looked around her. I'm not going, Sammy said. He glared up at Dicey. What do you do? James asked him, perfectly reasonably. Wait here for Mama. Not here, exactly. In the car. Sammy, you've got to come with us, Dicey said. First, we're going to stash these other three bags in the car. Then we start walking, so get up. Sammy shook his head. Don't you understand, Dicey asked. Mama's not coming back. Not here. Sammy didn't answer her. Sammy's stubbornness was beyond measure. When he made his mind up, there was nothing you could do to move him. Threats didn't work. He didn't mind being spanked or slapped. Explaining was no good. It was as if he didn't even hear what you were saying to him. Even Mama couldn't bully him into doing something. Even James couldn't trick him into it. But you couldn't go off and leave a six-year-old alone in the woods, in a strange place. Dicey crouched down beside him. The other two stood silent behind her. Sammy, Mama's not coming back here. That's what I think. I think she's forgotten. Mama wouldn't forget me. No, she wouldn't. But she's forgotten where we are, I think. So if we go to Aunt Scylla's, that's where she'll probably be. We have to go find her. I don't want to, Sammy said. But he was thinking about what she'd said. I don't want to either, Dicey said, but we have to. No, we don't, Sammy said. Dicey stood up in frustration and stamped her foot on the ground. And I'll carry you, she announced. I'll kick you, he stood up. Maybeth stepped forward. No, you won't, she said to Sammy. Mama said to do as Dicey tells us. You heard her. The two stared at one another. They were both sturdy little blonde figures with round bellies. Sammy was shorter than Maybeth, but almost as heavy. Please, Sammy, Maybeth said. Okay, Sammy said. At the edge of the woods, where the greasy roadside banked above the Matacam, they stopped to wait for an opening in the traffic. It was Sunday morning. People were driving to church or to the beach. The children could look back and see their own car, green and lonely, in the middle of the parking lot. It was kind of like a home, the car, Dicey thought. She understood why Sammy wanted to stay there. They crossed the road, but stopped at the edge of the parking lot. A blue police car was driving around the lot. It stopped by their car. A policeman got out and opened the door. He stuck his head in. He opened the glove compartment and went through the maps as if he was looking for something. He walked all around the car. He wrote something down in a little notebook, then he looked towards the mall. Walk, Daisy gave the order. She took Sammy's hand. Don't anybody look at our car. They walked on, away from the mall and the parking lot in the car. Daisy led them back to Route 1. There they turned south. They dumped the three grocery bags in the first trash can they saw. Nobody said a word. Route 1 was mostly garages and small shopping centers and discount stores and quick food places. There were no green patches and few sidewalks. They walked along concrete or asphalt or on roadside gravel. Soon their feet hurt. Dicey walked at half her normal speed because of Sammy's short legs. Trucks roared by and the sun grew hotter. The air smelled of oil and gas and nothing else. After an hour and a half, Sammy began to complain. It was the first time any of them had spoken. At the next McDonald's that had outside tables, Dicey let them sit down. One at a time, they went inside to the bathroom. They had to go through a room that smelled of hamburgers and french fries, and they all became aware of how hungry they were. Dicey ordered two large Cokes, which they all four shared. That refreshed them. Sitting still also refreshed them. How much longer is it? Sammy asked. A long way, Dicey said. We'll have to sleep outside tonight. good -o, Sammy said. Can we have a fire? I don't know. It depends on where we, got, we get to. This road is awful. That's for sure, James agreed. Dicey, when do we get lunch? I've been thinking, she answered. If we walk for a while, then rest a little. That's the best way. So we'll walk another hour or so, and I'll go into a supermarket. 
We should have fruit every day and maybe some donuts and milk. I'll see what they have. We've got to make our money last. It was hard to start off again. Sammy lagged back on Daisy's hand and she snapped at him time and again to keep up. He didn't like being snapped at, so he pulled back a little more while pretending to be hurrying as fast as he could. Daisy turned her head and saw Maybeth and James trudging along. Traffic passed them, roaring and honking. They passed building after building and an occasional vacant stretch where wispy trees looked like weeds grown up. Daisy's fingers cramped from holding onto the bag, so she moved it under her armpit, holding it by a hand across the base. The minutes stretched out. Daisy checked the, checked the time at every garage they passed. At noon, she began looking for a place to buy lunch, and at the next shopping center, they turned off the highway and walked to the front of a supermarket that was open for business on Sundays. Daisy left the little ones with James, sitting on a curb off around to one side, and entered the market alone. <clears throat> the electric eye door swung open before her. Daisy headed for the produce aisle, not even bothering to take a cart. If she could spend just 50 cents for lunch, they'd have $1.50 for dinner. She picked out four apples, then searched for the kind of rack they have in every supermarket, a place where they offered items that were damaged or old. She found it back by the meat department. She stood before it a minute, selecting a box of donuts at half price. That would be three donuts and an apple apiece. It cost 88 cents. Yes, my friends, this is what money got you in 1981. <laughs> They ate sitting on the curb with the sun hot overhead. Sammy couldn't eat his third donut, but he didn't want to give it away, so Dicey put it into their bag. They trooped by pairs into the market, first James and Sammy, then Dicey and Maybeth, to drink water from the fountain and use the toilets. The pair waiting outside watched the bag while the other pair was inside. Now we rest, Dicey said. How much longer is it? asked Sammy. I told you, more than today. Where are we going to camp? he asked. I'll tell you when we get there, she said. I haven't seen any place that looks good for sleeping, James said. I figure we'll have to get off this road to find something, otherwise the cars would keep us awake. I figure we'll turn off the road and see what we find. There was that woods this morning. That would have been all right. So there are bound to be others, don't you think? Walking is no fun, Sammy said. Think about the soldiers who had to march everywhere, Dicey said. We could pretend to be soldiers, James said. His eyes lit up. You could be the general, and I could be the major, and Sammy and Maybeth could be the army, and we could sing songs while we walk, so it would be like marching, and maybe give drill orders. We could be revolutionary soldiers going to Concord. Daisy didn't say that wouldn't make any difference. They'd still be walking. She agreed to go along with it. Everybody who talks to you has to say, sir, James elaborated the plan, and you two have to say, sir, to me. We should have a drum. When they set off again, they sang a song about marching to Pretoria and pretty Peggy O running down the stairs, letting down her golden hair. It was a song Mama sang. It even had a line in it. What will your Mama think? Because in the song, pretty Peggy O ran away with the captain. The afternoon wore on, wore away. Each rest period got longer. Each walking period got shorter. At mid-afternoon, they lay back in an overgrown lot next to two tiny houses, the only houses they'd seen that afternoon. I wouldn't want to live on this road, would you? Dicey said to nobody in particular. I bet it wasn't always like this, James answered. It might have been a nice road once, a country road, and these people might be old people or poor people who can't afford to move like us. Yeah, but our house was out in the dunes. We had the ocean. Our house was nicer than the ones the other people wanted. The bathtub was in the kitchen, James reminded her. It was small, even smaller than these houses. So what? Nobody else would have lived in it, only us. Some of the kids said their parents thought it should be torn down. What do I care what people say, Dicey asked. They called it a shack, James went on. I liked it, Dicey said. The ocean's better than fancy bathrooms any day. In the little one-story house next door, a door slammed. They turned their heads to watch as an energetic old woman came out, waving a broom over her head and shouting something. She was shouting at them. Dicey couldn't hear the words, but she understood the expression of fierce anger on the woman's face. As she came closer, they could hear her voice. Get out of here! Get out! Go on, get! I'm counting to ten and then I'm calling the police. I've had it with you kids hanging around and taking down clean laundry and dumping it in the dirt and tossing your trash and bottles into my lawn and throwing rocks at my door and your cars and your noise. One, she shrieked, her chin wagging up and down. 
The four children sprang to their feet. Here we go, Dicey said. I can't, Sammy said. I'm tired. You've got to, James said. No, I can't. Dicey tried to persuade him. We're soldiers, remember? No, we're not. That's just pretend. You have to carry me, piggyback. Dicey also was tired. I'll just leave you here, she said. Okay, Sammy sat down. The old woman shrieked anew. I've got to carry the bag, Dicey pleaded. His eyes regarded her calmly. Okay, okay. She gave in. James took the paper bag and Sammy jumped up onto Dicey's back. They set off to the accompaniment of the old woman's voice. And don't come back, ever. We won't, Dicey muttered. Don't worry. The afternoon was bleached hot white, hotter and whiter for Dicey with Sammy on her back. The air tasted bad in her mouth as she gasped for breath. The raucous cars roared past, unheeding. Dicey forced her feet to move and her legs and her hands to hold tight onto Sammy's feet and her back to stay straight because in the long run that would hurt less. It was only four when they stopped at a light, waiting for it to turn green as they could cross, so they could cross the road. Off, Dicey said to Sammy. He slid down. There were at least three more hours of daylight, but Dicey could go no further. She turned around and saw Maybeth's eyes big with unshed tears. The light changed and they crossed. Dicey stopped on the other side. Okay, she said. The next grocery store I'll get food. Then we'll have to get off this road to find a place to sleep. It'll be hard because it's got to be private enough. Three faces nodded at her, eyes blank with exhaustion. It was a small market where Dicey stopped next. Again, she went in alone. She bought bananas. They were cheapest by the pound and a package of hot dogs and a loaf of bread. You could wrap a slice of bread around a hot dog like a roll. And a half gallon of milk. It was a little cheaper that way. It cost almost $3, but she couldn't think of what to do about the expense. They were running out of money. When a narrow road ran off Route 1, marked by a sign that said Phillips Beach, six miles, Dicey led them across the four-lane highway and onto it. She chose the road because of the dead-end sign, which she reasoned meant that there wouldn't be many cars on the road. It turned out to have been good thinking. The blacktop twisted through a wooded area like a river, and then soon the sound of the highway had faded away behind them. The road made two sweeping curves before Dicey saw a ramshackle house with a for sale sign in front of it. The house had such a small front lawn, it almost sat on the road. It looked abandoned, its clapboard siding faded to splintery gray. Stay here, Dicey said. She walked across the front of the house, where tall grass on the short driveway told her no car had driven, not for a long time. She walked around to the back, alert to run should a face appear in the empty windows. The yard, overgrown and long neglected, stretched out behind the house to a large tree, and beyond that to woods. The quiet stretched out over the long grass and distant trees. An unscreened porch opened along the back of the worn house. That meant that they could have some shelter. Dicey trotted back and called her family to join her. The yard was like a private park, without swings, of course, but green and scattered with trees. Dicey sat down in the middle of it between two brown bags, one holding clothes, the other food. The others sat facing her. Feels good, doesn't it, James asked, but didn't wait for an answer. Maybe we should just stay here and live here. It wouldn't be too bad. I bet we could find a way into the house. That's trespassing, Dicey said severely. It's empty, Sammy pointed out. I'm just daydreaming, James said. He lay back on the long grass and spread out his arms and legs. He closed his eyes and a lazy smile floated over his narrow face. It's a bed, better than a bed, a cloud. They all fell asleep. When they woke, long bars of sunlight lay across the lawn. Sammy woke up first and roused the rest of them by calling back from the far end of the yard. Hey, it's a brook back here. James, wake up and come see. Dicey, her back too stiff to jump up as the others had, stayed put and rolled over onto her stomach to watch them run to join Sammy. They'd be okay for a while. She didn't have to worry about water. They could all swim, and they had good sense about water. Living next to the ocean, they had to. She wondered what time it was and how much daylight was left. The sun was still above the horizon. Maybe seven? That seemed about right but she wanted to look at her map to see where they were before the light got bad, and they would need to gather some wood. She listened to the splashing and calls while she traced her finger down the map. One day she put them about halfway there. She started at a dot named Madison and began moving her finger backwards. She saw no marking for Philip's speech. She called to James. He had noticed a sign saying they were near Stonington. 
What? she called back. He spelled it for her. But Stonington was almost next to Pawocket. Pawocket, excuse me, let me get the correct pronunciation. They showed me Pawocket. And they hadn't gone any distance at all. She called to James again. He was quite sure. Stonington. Then they had traveled, maybe. Dicey measured with her finger from the legend at the bottom corner of the map. Eight miles? Maybe ten? At that rate, she walked off sections of the road with her fingers. Would be days. More than a week. Two weeks. They'd have to conserve money and food. Quickly, she calculated a way to eat only half of the food tonight and the rest for the next dinner. No more Cokes, either. They cost 60 cents. No more small markets. They were more expensive. They could fish in Long Island Sound or the rivers. String and a hook? They'd have to buy those. And why didn't she have a knife? None of them did. Not even a jackknife. They hadn't planned this properly. They hadn't planned it at all. Dicey couldn't see how they'd make it to Bridgeport, and a cold panic settled in her stomach. There was nothing for it, though, was there? Just going ahead. People might give them food. She might be able to earn food or money somehow. She couldn't think how they'd manage it, but they would have to manage it somehow. Then she didn't think any more about it. She couldn't. They gathered wood, some twigs, and, a hand and handfuls of dried leaves. Accustomed to building fires on the beach, they found it easy to light the small starting pile of leaves and twigs with the matches Dicey had taken from the counter in the store. They skewered hot dogs on green branches, and when they were cooked, wrapped them in slices of bread. They passed the milk container around and around. Each had a half banana for dessert and a quarter of Sammy's donut. The fire, fed with the bigger branches, burned brightly in the darkening air. Dicey wanted them to sleep on the porch. It's more hidden away, she explained. I'm going to sleep by the fire where it's warm, Sammy said. We're not going to put any more wood on the fire, Dicey told him. Why not? Dangerous. It could spread. It could burn you. I'd wake up first, Sammy said. It couldn't burn me. Well, I'm not going to take a chance, Dicey said. Well, I'm going to sleep here anyway, Sammy said. He lay on his stomach facing the fire with the light drifting over his stubborn face. We've got to sleep together, Dicey said. I don't see why, he answered and yawned. We've got to stick together, she repeated. Mama didn't, he said. We have to, Dicey said. Well, I don't care, he said. He refused to speak again and was soon asleep. Maybeth curled up next to Dicey, resting her head against her sister's thigh. It's all right, Dicey, she said. I'm going to sing. Doesn't the fire make you feel like singing? Dicey would have said no, but after Maybeth had sung through one verse of Mama's song about the cherry that has no stone, she joined in, and James did too. The song put Maybeth to sleep. You tired? Dicey asked James. Yeah, but not tired enough to sleep yet, he said. Well, let the fire go out, then carry them to the porch. If you say so, but I don't see why, James said. It'll be safer out of sight. The fire crackled and spat. Its light made a hemisphere of warmth across which Dicey looked to see her small sleeping brother. James, do you remember Sammy at the beach? James grinned. I do. That was some fun, wasn't it? They gathered up the two sleepers and carried them back to the porch. Sammy half awoke to protest, but slept again. He was too tired even to quarrel. Poor kid, Dicey thought. James lay down with them, but Dicey returned to the dying fire to make sure it had burned out entirely. Sammy at the beach, when he was only a year and a half old, and running. Summer days, eight-year-old Dicey was responsible for taking them all down to the beach. Sammy wore an old bathing suit of James's over his diapers. The first thing he'd do every time was take off his clothes. Then he'd turn to see their expressions and laugh and clap his hands together with a smile spread all over his face. He had a little noise he made to go with the clapping. Aye! He learned that from them because they would applaud his mistakes and his learnings and cry, Yay! as they clapped. Dicey could still remember his short, plump little body, sturdy legs, and round blonde head, and his tiny penis that bobbed up and down as he ran. He had a game he played with the waves, of going down to them, then turning to run away. He usually tripped and fell, and the tip of the wave would wet him as it washed up the beach. He would raise a dripping face and laugh, then elevate his fanny, put his feet under him, and totter erect again. He would clap and cry, Hey! as they all giggled and clapped back at him. Sammy had been such a cheerful baby. He had been able to bring laughter even to Mama's face. 
They would watch him move around and explore the way other people watch television. When had Sammy changed? His first words were hot. He would grab out for anything. And no. No, he would cry, waving his arms, his face dreadfully earnest. He emptied cupboards and drawers. He unmade his bed. He grabbed his homework papers and ran away, laughing. He was naughty, but not mean, not selfish. And he was stubborn, even then when he was a baby. Dicey had watched him learn to turn around in a circle, patiently practicing, tumbling over his own feet, falling in a heap, sitting down in surprise. It took him days to do it, but he learned. He was no less stubborn now, no less determined to have his own way. But what had happened to that happiness? Could anyone change that much? It must have been gradual or they would have noticed. Daisy tried to remember the last time she heard Sammy laugh, and that had been laughing at Maybeth because a doll she made out of seagrass had been washed away by a wave. But Daisy also remembered Sammy's merry eyes and his mouth with only ten teeth, opened wide in the kind of laughter that took over his whole body and made him stumble and fall down laughing. The fire was out. She stamped on it just to be safe and retired to the porch. Thanks for listening, guys. Chapter three will be coming soon. Please leave comments below if you're enjoying the story, because I think it's an amazing story. Like I said in the first video, I've read this book many, many times, starting with fifth grade, and I'm 47 now, so <laughs> I've read it many, many times, and I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I do. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll be back soon with more stuff. Bye.